today, the saga of why did Game Freak design all the new Pokemon in Generation 2 so badly continues with a solo playthrough of the first form Pokemon Natu. As a kid, there was nothing about these games' gameplay that made me want this thing as a part of my team. First of all, you just never find it in the wild unless you're going out of your way. Also, once you get to Will, he is so underwhelming as a trainer that you don't think, I want one of those Pokemon on my team, it was so strong and difficult to defeat. For me, that's incredibly disappointing, especially after the Kanto League, because trainers like Lorelei really made you want to use a Pokemon like Slowbro or Lapras on your own team. So until now, I have actually never done a playthrough with this thing as a part of my team. So today, I'm going to try it out for the first time. In Generation 1, Psychic Types were completely broken, so I was hoping that picking this Psychic Type up in Generation 2, it would be pretty good. And as a first stage Pokémon, its stats aren't that bad. It has 40 HP, 50 attack, 45 defense, 70 special attack, 45 special defense, and 70 speed. Most of those make sense, it has a lot of special attack, after all it is a primary psychic type. Its physical attack is not great, so the flying type is not going to be doing that much damage, because in generation 2, flying moves are all physical. Its typing gives it weaknesses to rock, ghost, electric, ice, and dark. These five typings as a group to be weak to in Johto are actually quite good. Brock is all the way in Kanto and he's not that challenging. Morty really only has one Pokemon with a ghost type move, which is his Gengar knowing Shadow Ball. Surge is again all the way in Kanto and not that challenging. Price is absolutely terrible. And so the only type that I'm really worried about is the dark type because Karen is terrifying. However, she's not the only thing I'm worried about for this playthrough, because if we look at Natu's move pool, things are not good. In the early game, it gets access to Peck and Leer, and then learns Nightshade at level 10. After that, though, things go downhill. It gets Teleport at level 20, Future Sight at level 30, Confuse Ray at level 40, and then Psychic all the way at level 50. So I would really like to ask Game Freak why this thing doesn't learn Confusion or Psybeam. Like, can we just replace Teleport with Confusion, or like Nightshade with Confusion, and then Future Sight with Psybeam? That would make Natu so much better. However, I do want to point out the fact that Peck early on in one of these playthroughs is absolutely incredible, and I'm going to discuss why in a little bit as we go through this challenge, but for now, it's just able to knock out Pokemon like Hophip and Caterpie on the early routes of the game very quickly, giving me fast experience. So now let's move on to the TMs and HMs that Natu can learn. And here, I thought that I was going to get some relief from my level up learn set, but it's honestly the opposite of that. Let's just look at special moves that would utilize its best offensive stat. And uh, yeah, first we have Hidden Power Dark, because I have perfect DVs in this playthrough, but I am not allowed to use Hidden Power on my first attempt, so can't use that move. Let's go to the next special move which is Giga Drain, which you get access to in Kanto after defeating Erika. Then you can get Solar Beam, but that is just before Victory Road, and you have to have Waterfall, so I can't use that until I beat Claire. After that, I can learn Psychic by TM, and you might think that this is great, but no, no, no. Once again, that is only available in Kanto right after you get off the SS Aqua and head to Saffron City. Beyond that, there are only two more special moves. The first one is Dream Eater, and Natu has no way of putting the opponent to sleep, so this move is absolutely useless. Pretty sure Game Freak included this move as well as Nightmare on Pokemon's learn sets, just so they can counter Pokemon that are using Rest and Sleep Talk. Anyways, it's not going to be useful in today's playthrough. So, the final move that is special that Natu can learn is Thief, an absolutely awful dark type move. I can't believe it, I'm actually going to have to beat the majority of Johto with physical moves. However, at this moment you might be like, hey Scott, wait, 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 there's Future Sight, which has base 80 power and it is a psychic move, so why not just use that? Well, let's talk about it. When this move is selected, it does nothing for two turns. Then it deals damage to the opponent, but in a very special way. This damage skips type effectiveness, so it will never deal super effective damage. This is good in one case because it can actually hit dark Pokemon, but things get even worse for this move because skipping type effectiveness also causes it to skip the same type attack bonus. So yeah, it's just effective power 80 even though my Natu is a psychic type. 
honestly, because you have to wait two turns to deal any damage, this move is basically Generation 2's version of Psy Wave. I'm probably not going to use it. It seems completely useless. Okay, so let's just make peace with things. For the early portions of the game, I'm just going to be spamming Peck. Let's talk about some other aspects of Natu as a Pokemon. It's a medium fast growth rate Pokemon, which ends up being a bad thing for it in the early game. It's really going to slow me down. I wanted a little bit more experience before facing someone like Faulkner, so I am going to complete Sprout Tower today. After all, Natu is going to absolutely tear through this place using Peck against the Bellsprout here. With it out of the way, I head back to Violet City Gym, defeat the Bird Keepers here, leveling up to 13, and now I am ready to take on Faulkner. So I said that the flying type was really good in the early game for Johto playthroughs, and that is immediately apparent here because Faulkner cannot hit me with his most powerful move, Mud Slap. With Peck, I'm able to get a two-hit knockout on the first Pidgey, and now I'm going to move on to his ace, Pidgeotto. This thing is doing very little damage with Gust every turn, and Peck looks like it has a three-hit range, so defeating Faulkner is not an issue for Natu. And from here, his badge makes the flying type even better. First of all, I get a 12.5% boost to my attack stat, making flying type moves more powerful. And additionally, I also get a type-based boost, which makes flying type moves deal 12.5% more damage. Yes, these two boosts from Faulkner's badge stack. However, it's not all good things from Faulkner's badge, because while he does give me the Mudslap TM, Natu cannot learn it. So Gligar today can rejoice, he has company with another flying type that can't learn this move. On the next route, I face all of the trainers, except of course the Magikarp guy, he's just really gonna slow me down. After that, I head into Union Cave and grab the TM for Swift, which I am gonna teach right away. Notable here is the fact that this 60 base power move is actually more powerful than Peck by just one effective power. That's after the type-based badge boost, by the way. Outside of the cave, I face Hiker Anthony. You might think that he would be scary because he has a Geodude with Rock Throw, but I can tank one of them fairly easy, finish it off on the next turn, and then easily knock out the following Machop. Okay, so let's head into Slowpoke Well. I'm just going to point out one hidden item here in case you don't know about it. At the back of the well entrance, you can talk to this tile and pick up a full heal. This is really useful in Bugsy's gym in case the Paris specifically paralyzes you. Okay, with that out of the way, let's finish off all the rockets. Also, inside of the gym, I'm going to finish off all of the trainers here with weak bug type Pokemon. And that takes Natu all the way up to level 20 before I face Bugsy. To start this battle off, I am going to sing praise for the flying type once again. After receiving both badge boosts from Faulkner's badge, I then have a type effectiveness advantage over the second gym leader. This allows Natu to knock out both the Metapod as well as the Kakuna in a single hit each and move on to Bugsy's ace, Scyther. Okay, so Peck is doing more than half. The Scyther hits Fury Cutter, which is neutrally effective in this case, but it only does 5 damage. And so, on the next turn, I finish him off and earn my myself the second badge. However, Azalea Town is not done with me yet, because usually there is one trainer here which is difficult. Either it's Bugsy, or it's the rival. Today with Natu, Peck almost KOs the Ghastly, and then it puts me to sleep with Hypnosis. One of my favorite moves, by the way, but not when it's being used against me. Also, my Natu sleeps for a ridiculous number of turns. Not one, not two, not three. It actually sleeps for four turns, and then I eat my berry. I'm still asleep, so that is five turns of sleep in a row. Finally, on the sixth turn, I wake up, and I KO his first Pokemon. So that was a really unlucky start to this fight. Next, he sends in Zubat. I go for Peck. Zubat misses Supersonic, so the luck is kind of evening out, and I knock it out with Peck. All right, he only has one Pokemon left. It is his ace, Quilava. Against it, I figure that Nightshade actually might be doing a bit more damage. Looks like it's going to be a 3 hit, I tank an Ember, go for another Nightshade, Ember hits me again, and I just barely survive and am able to pull off the victory. Once I've cleared this area of the game, most Pokemon usually get a major moveset upgrade. A lot of times they can learn Headbutt in the forest, unfortunately Natu cannot learn this move. Game Freak just really wanted to make this Pokemon bad. Also then in Goldenrod City you can usually buy the TMs for like the punches and teach those to your Pokemon, or pick up the TM for rollout on the route past Goldenrod City, but Natu is not going to get any of this today. Instead I'm going to have to rely on overleveling to beat Whitney, after all she does have Miltank with rollout which is super effective against 
against Natu. At the end of the forest, I'm just going to point out one thing, which is a crystal exclusive. There's this guy hiding between some trees. He's actually a trainer, but you can only fight him if you talk to him. It's really strange. Anyways, I'm going to fight him today because I want as much experience as possible. I continue my training throughout all the regions surrounding Goldenrod City and end up in the National Park. Here, there are four trainers, and the final one is a guy with Raichu, and it does know Thunderbolt. It chooses it, but Natu survives and gets the knockout. So I skipped a few trainers on some of the routes, but I mostly fought everyone. I'm going to continue by fighting all of the trainers in the gym, and this brings Natu to just under level 28 before Whitney. Up first is Clefairy, and the experience from this thing is going to get me over the next damage rounding threshold. I'm able to do more than half with my first hit, I tank double slap really well, and knock it out. Okay, so it's time for the mill tank. I go for Swift, getting a critical hit, and it only does a third. Oh no, that's bad. Mill tank starts to roll, then it gets a crit with its second turn of rollout, so that's bad luck for me. As a result, Natu has its first reset here. Okay, so let's try that again. I just want to feel this fight out a little bit more. Then the Clefairy goes for Metronome, gets Zap Cannon, which causes paralysis. So I am going to lose this second fight. Okay, so I just don't think this fight is going to be possible without a new strategy. So what can I do to improve Zatu's chances here? Well, first of all, I can go and train so that I'm at a higher level. And while I was doing this, I realized that there's another option. Because I've trained so much, I will have gained a lot of friendship. So I can head back to the department store and pick up Return, which if you check on the right hand side of the screen, you can see its current dynamic power, so it is going to be doing more damage than Swift. Also, I can head back to the game corner and purchase myself a second Abra. Yes, I already picked up one earlier, I always do. And I can trade this on the fifth floor of the department store to get a Machop that is holding a gold berry. This will help me recover 30 hit points of damage. After that, I buy myself two proteins, improving Natu's physical attack, and now I'm ready to attempt Whitney again. Clefairy chooses Metronome, oh no, but this time it gets Tackle, so I easily knock it out and move on to the Mill Tank. Return looks like it's doing less than a third. Miltank chooses Stomp, which is much better than Rollout on the first turn. I take it to Orange, it starts to roll. Then it takes me to Red on the next turn. I survive though, use the Goldberry, and KO the Miltank. Alright, I did it. And this is another useful badge boost, especially for flying types. Often, they are paired with the normal type, or they are using a lot of normal type moves, which is the case in this playthrough, so now I get a type-based boost to my normal type attacks. Also, I get a speed boost, but that's not going to be super useful for Natu, because it is already quite fast. Alright, so now let's head towards Ecritique City, where it would be really nice to have some psychic moves. But of course, Game Freak did not think that that was okay for Natu. This thing needs to have no psychic moves. Well, I guess I could have teleport, but that doesn't really count. Let's face the Sudowoodoo now. I easily finish it off with Nightshade, and then I head towards Ecritique City. Now on my way, there is one spinner, and today he catches me. And I'm a bit bruised going into this battle because I didn't think to heal. Anyways, Return is probably just going to KO the Drowsy. But it doesn't. Drowsy goes for Hypnosis, and oh no, I hope I do not sleep as many times as I did in Azalea Town. Unfortunately for me, I sleep four turns in a row, allowing Dream Eater to slowly chip away at me. But as things are getting very dire, Natu wakes up, I get a hit in, and knock the Drowsy out. Ugh, another close fight. You know what's not going to be close? All of the fights against the Kimono Girls in Ecritique City. I'm going to show you the battle against Jolteon, just so that you know that it's really easy in here. After that, I continue training west of Ecritique City. I grab the Mint Berry and then head to Olivine City. I do the regular errands, picking up the Good Rod, as well as grabbing Strength. And after that, I can grab the Sharp Beak. Another reason that the Flying type is amazing, because this item is available fairly early on into the playthrough. Also, it is going to help me against Morty, because I'm going to have to use Flying type moves against him. So I like coming all this way over to Olivine City before facing Morty, just because I can get some additional training in at the lighthouse. I have to clear out this region and talk to Jasmine, just so that when I surf across the sea, I can pick up the secret potion and bring it back with me. So with these trainers out of the way, let's head back to the burn tower and face the rival. Here I'm hoping that Peck is going to KO the Haunter, but unfortunately it doesn't and it sets up Curse. This is a problem because next is Magnemite, and I'm going to have to two-hit this thing with Nightshade. In the process, Natu gets confused, and that's a bit annoying because the rival still has two Pokemon left over. 
If I hit myself, I will also take 25% damage from Curse, and that is just unacceptable. Luckily, I don't damage myself and knock the Zubat out in a single hit. In Generation 2, when this happens, you don't actually take any Curse damage. Against the Quilava, Natu snaps out of Confusion, hits Return for more than half, Quilava uses Smoke Screen, but I still hit through it and finish the rival off. So now, it's time to take on Morty. His first two ghosts, no curse. And that is really scary when his third Pokemon, Gengar, has super effective damage against my Pokemon. Luckily, I'm able to one-hit KO the first Ghastly, so it's not able to use Curse. Then, on the Haunter, I'm gonna get a two-hit. However, it luckily chooses Nightshade. I guess it thinks this is super effective, so I move on to the Gengar without an annoying status condition. Now here, Natu has the speed to move first, so I think I'm only gonna need to avoid one Hypnosis. Unless I do less than half with Peck. However, at this point, I want to slow the footage down a little bit and just mention how inaccurate Hypnosis is when the AI uses it. So in Generation 2, the AI has an accuracy debuff when it uses certain moves. Commonly in these playthroughs, this applies to moves like Hypnosis as well as Thunder Wave. This is a 25% debuff to the move, so Thunder Wave only has a 75% accuracy when used by the computer. However, this is even worse for Hypnosis, because what it does is it takes the move's base accuracy and multiplies it by the debuff of 0.75. So in the case where Morty uses Hypnosis, he actually only has a 45% chance for it to hit. So obviously as you saw here, the Gengar did not hit its second Hypnosis, and as a result, I am able to take a victory. Now just hold in your mind this AI debuff, because it is going to be relevant again when we get to Chuck. However, first of all, I have to defeat the trainers in his gym. And there is one specifically that I'm a bit scared of. It's Nob. This is because his Machoke knows Rock Slide, but luckily for me in this case, he just goes for Karate Chop, which doesn't do very much, and I finish him off. So now, let's face Chuck. And without an intro here, I just want to talk about the Hypnosis interaction when he uses Mind Reader. Because even after he sets this move up, it still checks against the AI accuracy debuff. So essentially what happens is that it boosts Hypnosis' accuracy from 60% to 100%, and then it gets multiplied by 0.75, resulting in a 25% chance for Chuck to miss Hypnosis. In this case though, he doesn't even set up Mind Reader, so he just misses Hypnosis because it has 45% accuracy. I can't believe that. This move is so bad when the AI uses it. After that, the Polyrath uses Surf, which does actually a decent amount, but not enough, and Natu is able to take the victory. Okay everyone, I want you to look over at Natu's art. I realize this is a tiny bird, but it is always very frustrating for me when I am using a flying type Pokemon and it cannot learn the move fly. So for the next section of the game, my moveset is going to stay unchanged with Peck being my best same type attack bonus move. However, access to this HM does give me some useful benefits. I can pick up the pink bow to boost normal type moves. In Violet City, I grab a rare candy, as well as all the way over here by the gym. If you surf on the water, there is actually a PP up way back there, which is honestly one of Johto's best kept secrets. I didn't know about this item for so long. After that, I hit Goldenrod City, going south and surfing to grab a nugget and a rare candy, and then I head to the Lake of Rage. Here, I just want to make a small correction for a former video. I said there are three ways to end the battle with the Gyarados. You can either catch it, defeat it, or use a Poké Doll, but that is not actually true in my case. I was correct the first time I spoke, saying that I have to catch or defeat it, because I cannot in fact use a Poké Doll, because that violates my rule of using items during battle. If you're curious about all the other rules, check them out in the description. After that, Lance beats a guy up with his Dragonite, then we beat up some Electrodes together. As a result, I feel very guilty, so now it is time to pay the price. And by that, I mean I have to face price, and here, Natu has a type disadvantage. By the time I make it all the way to the Piloswine, I have less than half health remaining. It goes for Blizzard, and it KOs! Okay, so price is usually really bad, let's try this again. This time the Piloswine misses Blizzard, letting me get in a second return, but it survives, and then the next Blizzard hits, and once again, price wins. Alright, so let's fight all of the gym trainers here. That doesn't give me enough experience, so I decide to go back to the water route by the Whirl Islands and train against the trainers here. While I was doing that, I was wondering, maybe I can beat Jasmine? After all, I have a Paralyzed Cureberry, and Nightshade is going to do fixed damage. 
It allows me to two hit the first Magnemite, but I did get confused. Natu hits itself, I get paralyzed, that consumes my berry, I hit myself again, Magnemite goes for Thunderbolt, and yeah, this is just not gonna work out. As a result, I'm gonna continue training to level 45, which is a damage rounding threshold. This gives return the one hit on Price's seal, so I can't get hit by Icy Wind and have my speed lowered. Next is Dugong, this thing is a two hit, and then Pyloswine comes out. It is also gonna be a two hit, and the increase to my level must have meant that Blizzard stops being a one hit because the Pyloswine chooses to use Mist instead of the powerful same type attack bonus move. As a result, I finally get the victory over Price. Anyways, I should just say that any playthrough that has one reset against him is bad in my books. Okay, so now it's time to head back to Jasmine. Maybe using Confuse Ray here will give me the win. The first Magnemite hits itself twice, allowing me to knock it out without getting paralyzed. So then, the second one only has to hit itself once. This allows my berry to cure paralysis on the second turn, and with that I have made it to the Steelix without a status condition. Okay, so Confuse Ray first, it takes Confusion damage, I go for Nightshade, taking it to half, it hits itself again, and then Nightshade KOs. I can't believe it, I cleared Jasmine, and her badge gives a boost to my defense stat. At this point I want to talk one final time about the flying type's advantage in the early game. By this portion of the playthrough, the badge boosts and all of the different advantages that I'm getting from the playthrough have started to really wear off. So from here on out, the flying type is not going to perform as well. Well, uh, that, that is when your best flying type move is Peck and you don't get anything else. Like I didn't talk about that at the beginning of the video, but Natu does not get any other flying type moves. Like what? Just Peck? Really? I looked up its egg moves just to check if it gets a flying move there, and yes, it does get Drill Peck. Why didn't they just make this a move that it could learn naturally? That would make this thing so much better. Anyways, let's continue with the playthrough. And uh, here I just want to note, we're going through the radio tower, and I run into this guy who has three Magnemites. And yeah, I, I can't believe I'm saying this, but the scientist defeats me because he gets paralysis and the luck is just so bad. This has a big consequence, because I have to face Jasmine again. And this time I do not get as lucky with Confusion, and her Magnemite knocks Natu out. Honestly, I don't think it's one of my playthroughs if we don't have a major mistake somewhere. So let's go and do a little bit of training because Psychic is actually not that far away. So I grind up to level 48 and then I use two rare candies, which is truly a rare event in the Johto portion of a playthrough. This gives Natu level 50 where I can finally learn a special move. With Psychic on its side, despite the Steel types resisting it, I am overleveled enough and the same type attack bonus damage in combination with my higher special attack stat gives me KOs on Jasmine's first two Pokemon. Then against the Steelix, I get an easy two hit. So once again, I am headed towards the radio tower to defeat the Grunts here. And throughout this next section of the game, things are actually going to be much easier for Natu. I clear the rival, buy some vitamins. You might expect that the final Rocket Executive might put up a fight because he does have Dark types. He has a Houndour as well as a Houndoom, but he doesn't. So I fly back to Mahogany Town and train on the trainers east of here. And then to test damage ranges for Claire, I go up against one trainer in her gym with a level 37 Dragonair. Now his DVs are not as good as hers, but it's still a decent test and it looks like Natu with Psychic is going to be able to get the KOs. So let's see how this tiny bird does against the final gym leader of the region. First Dragonair, let's see if Psychic gets the KO, and the answer is yes. All right, that is really good, so at least I have the ability to roll damage that will knock these Dragonairs out in one hit. But will I secure the one hit on the next one? The answer once again is yes. So with that, I'm able to KO the third Dragonair as well and move on to her ace, Kingdra. Now this thing is kind of scary if you're underleveled, but honestly in my playthroughs, I never really have that many problems against it. Today, after doing more than half, it just goes for smokescreen, but Psychic still hits, and with that, I have completed the gym challenge. Okay, so on the route before Victory Road, I'm going to do as much training as possible, defeating all of the trainers here. Also, I'm going to pick up the TM for Solar Beam, because why not? It is a special move after all. So there's only one more battle before the league, which is against the rival. In this case, he leads with a dark type, Sneasel, but I should just be able to one hit this thing with return, and I do. Up next, he sends in Magneton, I go for Psychic, it doesn't KO, and as a result, Natu gets paralyzed. Now I didn't bring a berry into this battle to heal the status, so I get hit before I take it out. 
Next is Golbat, it goes for Bite, doing a little bit more damage. Psychic finishes this thing off in one hit, and now I'm onto his final three Pokemon. Up first, he sends in Haunter. It's kind of annoying that I'm paralyzed, because then it can set up Curse before I knock it out with Psychic. Also, if Paralysis gets its 25% chance to stop me from moving, this is going to do a lot of damage throughout the rest of the fight. I finish off the Kadabra with a single return, and move on to the Typhlosion. And here, Paralysis finally activates twice in a row, giving Natu a reset. In the next battle though, the Magneton doesn't choose Thunder Wave, instead it goes for Thunder Shock, and this allows me to proceed without the status condition, I make it back to the Typhlosion with good health, do a ton of damage with Psychic, tank a Flame Wheel, and finish the rival off. Okay, so we've made it to the League with a Natu. It's level 59. I'm really not sure if I'm going to be able to get through all of the League, but I might as well try. So, here we go. It's time for the Elite Four. I just expressed doubt about Natu's chances against the League, but that does not apply for the first three League members. After all, I resist Will's attacks, and I am super effective against both Koga and Bruno. So let's talk about the first of these battles. Honestly, this is really how I felt going up against him as a kid. I one-hit KO his first Zatu, and then I knock out his Jinx. After that, he sends in his second Zatu, which I just barely fail to knock out. However, I only take a small amount of damage, he heals, and then I get the knockout. So yeah, after this underwhelming performance, there was no way that I wanted a Zatu on my team. Anyways, Slowbro's next. This thing usually slows things down. It takes three hits and does a small amount with Psychic before I polish it off, and move on to his final Pokemon, the Executor. Now interestingly enough, here with the Pink Bow, Return is going to do more damage than Peck. So I 3 hit the Executor, and that's an easy first League member. However, for Natu, things get easier now, because Koga is a series of 5 one hits. Yes, not even the Crobat or the Muk are able to survive one of my super effective Psychics. And if you thought that that was easy, the next fight is also easy because once again it is a series of 5 one hits against Bruno. Normally in this case you would expect the Machamp to survive, but it doesn't, so now I am moving on to the trainer who is actually going to be a challenge. Karen leads with Umbreon, and this thing is so annoying because of how tanky it is. The reason that this is so bad is because it's great at ruining your accuracy with Sand Attack or confusing you with Confuse Ray. Complicating the matters is that Natu is going to 3 hit the Umbreon, well uh, unless I get a critical hit and knock it out in 2 hits. Okay, so that's really good luck. Can it keep going with Natu not hitting itself in Confusion? And the answer is no. It hits itself a total of two times, and that allows Murkrow of all Pokemon to KO with Faint Attack. This is probably the weakest Pokemon on her team, and losing to it is definitely a bad omen. However, at the start of the next fight, things actually are looking up for me. I two-hit KO the Umbreon, so I must have a roll against it. This time I have no confusion for the Murkrow, so I easily one-hit it, but then because of Sand Attack I miss on the Houndoom, Crunch does two-thirds, and Return doesn't KO, so that's a second loss. Up until now, things haven't really gone badly against the Umbreon, and believe me, they can. I miss because of Sand Attack, fail to attack because of Confusion, and that gives me my third loss. What I started to realize is that I think I'm going to have to get lucky to win at this level. I don't think I have a better option than just using Return with the Pink Bow for maximum damage. So what is one way that I could get lucky and win this fight? Well, Sand Attack can miss because of the AI's debuff, and Umbreon uses Faint Attack on the second turn, so I'm able to knock it out without any status conditions or accuracy drops. That allows me to one-hit the Murkrow, and now I can't miss against the Houndoom. I just barely survive Crunch, KO after a Max Potion, and then for Karen's final two Pokemon, I have super effective damage in the form of Psychic. It knocks the Gengar out, and now Vileplume is last. I think I am going to do this. I go for Psychic, and it KOs. So for now, Karen is finished. Let's move on to Lance. Psychic 2 hits the Gyarados, with it setting up Rain Dance before going down. Now the first two Dragonite are going to be annoying because they know Thunder Wave. However, it misses and I get the knockout. Then on the second Dragonite, it paralyzes me with Thunder Wave, but I have the paralyzed Cure Berry, so I'm able to heal the status and move on to the Aerodactyl. Alright, so it survives my attack, goes for Rock Slide, doing almost one half. However, I'm able to knock it out on the next turn, and now it's time for Charizard. 
Unfortunately for me, the rain is gone by the point that it's coming out. It takes Natu into the red with Flamethrower, and while I am able to KO it, I just don't have enough health left over for the final Dragonite. I do about half, which is encouraging, but it knocks me out with its first attack. So what I really need is more health. If I teach Rest in the place of Nightshade, I can't believe that I actually still have Nightshade and Peck on my moveset at this point. Like, Natu's moves are so bad. Anyways, this will allow me to use Rest on the Charizard, but that doesn't end up working because Flamethrower is doing too much damage, so I can't heal. What I try in the next fight is using Rest on the final Dragonite, but unfortunately Outrage is also doing too much. Now I could wait till I get good luck here with Outrage inflicting confusion and then Dragonite hitting itself, but I think I want a little bit more consistent way to win than that, so let's black out and level up a little bit more. In Victory Road, I grind until level 66, and then defeating Will, Koga, and Bruno brings Natu up to level 67. Alright, we have to beat Karen again. I did say that she was done for now. <laughs> However, in this case, the extra levels really help against her. I now have what looks like a guaranteed two hit on the Umbreon. I did take a sand attack in the process this time. Luckily, I hit the Murkrow, one hitting it. And then interestingly enough, I have a KO roll on the Houndoom, proven by the fact that I get it after Karen uses a max potion. Unfortunately, I miss on the Gengar, take a little bit of damage, putting me at red. However, Psychic KOs, Vileplume comes out, I hit it, and so this fight was much better this time. And now I'm back at Lance, and here I don't really have to worry about Thunder Wave as much just because I have Rest. Also, I now have improved my damage ranges enough to one-hit both the Aerodactyl and the Charizard with Psychic. So I get to the final Dragonite with full health, it just uses Safeguard because it doesn't see good damage ranges against me, I guess. So I actually end up taking the victory in this fight without taking a single hit point in damage. That was a dramatically different result. So now it is time to head to Kanto, and I can't believe that I still have Peck on my moveset for this portion of the game. You might think that it would be helpful for Erika, but Psychic is just better here. Yes, even against the Blossom, where the Peck is super effective and Psychic is not. And the rest of the gym leaders here should be really easy. Okay, so Misty Starmie ends up confusing me, which is a bit annoying. And uh, yeah, then it goes for Ice Beam and gets a freeze. Well, Natu can defrost, right? But it doesn't, and Misty hands out a reset. It is always very painful when I lose to Kanto gym leaders. But without silly freeze luck in the next fight, she isn't a match for my tiny bird and I take a win. I figured that someone was going to ask in the comments about Surge, so I should probably show the footage. By the way, it is a series of five one-hits. Yes, he is completely awful. By the way, it is exactly the same story for Brock, but maybe Blue at the very end of all of Kanto is going to be a threat. So I'm going to take that fight seriously. Leftovers is usually the best item here. Pidgeot is a two hit, and then Blue sends in his Rhydon because it gets super effective damage with Rock Slide. I go for Psychic, and I get the KO. After that, I one hit the Alakazam, and then he sends in Gyarados. This thing slows the fight down because he uses a full restore on it, requiring me to hit it three turns in a row. By the way, here I just want to mention that the Gyarados sets up Rain Dance, and then after it, he has both an Arcanine and an Executor. The first one is a fire type, and the second one uses Solar Beam. I really love that he sets up the rain before these two. I easily finish off the Arcanine, and last is the Executor. One last time I'm going to use Peck because it does slightly more than return turn in this case when I'm not using the pink bow. So blue ended up being very easy. With him out of the way, let's move on to the final test in Generation 2. It's almost time for red. But before that, I need to use my final eight rare candies, and I had to do a little bit of planning for this. I'm currently level 75, so if I use eight rare candies, then I'll be level 83. However, I would rather be level 85 for red, just to give Natu a little bit of an easier time. So I train on wild Pokemon, taking Natu up to level 77, and then I use my rare candies, boosting it all the way to level 85. Okay, now I'm ready, let's take on red. Up first is his Pikachu. I go for Psychic, and I get the Knockout. Alright, that is great. Next, he chooses to send in Blastoise because it has super effective damage in the form of Blizzard. However, because my health is very high, he prioritizes setting up first with Rain Dance, and this gives me a free Knockout with two Psychics. Next is Espeon, and this thing ends up being a 3 hit just because it sets up Reflect, resisting my physical damage with Return. By the way, it does hit me once with Psychic, but it only does a small amount of damage, and then I polish it off. So things are actually going really well. 
But next is Red Snorlax, and this thing is a beast. With Reflect Up, Return is doing so little. I get paralyzed, I thought I'd survive one more hit with leftovers, but I don't, and get knocked out. Okay, so there's obviously an easy solution here. What is the go-to move for most first stage Pokemon? Well, of course, it's Curse. The reason this is always a go-to is because it prevents massive damage from the Snorlax because you can boost your defense. Also, boosting your attack stat means you will deal more physical damage, and the Snorlax has no way to set up its physical defenses. Still, this isn't going to be a guarantee though. While I do manage to knock the Snorlax out, the Charizard is doing a lot with Flamethrower. I wasn't sure if I was going to survive the second hit, but luckily, Natu does just barely, and I finish off the Flaming Lizard. Alright, all that's left is Red's Venusaur. Now, this thing has a bad moveset. The only two damage dealing moves it has are Giga Drain and Solar Beam. I actually think that Giga Drain might get the KO, but in this case it chooses Solar Beam, taking in energy, giving me the time I need to hit it with one Psychic, and clock in, with a time of 2 hours, 20 minutes, and 40 seconds, with 17 resets at level 85. This took 8 hours and 26 minutes of game time. So now just before we get into the second playthrough, I want to make some remarks about the first playthrough. And to do that, I just want to explain one thing that me and one of my programmers, while have been doing behind the scenes to try and make these videos a little bit more informative for all of you. We have added to my ROM a bunch of functions that track various things throughout the playthrough. So here are some examples of the new properties that we can track. We can track the total number of frames that I spent playing the game. In this case, it was 1,843,169. Nice. Of those frames, nearly 1 million of them were spent in battle. So more than half of the time that I spent playing the game was actually during battles. Notably, I saved the game 56 times during this playthrough, I fought 231 trainers, fought 132 wild encounters, and I hit the enemy Pokemon with 871 moves, of which 56 got critical hits, which is roughly 6.42% of all hits. By the way, I intend to track more properties in the future. Some of them that we've been working on are a little bit bugged at the current moment, so stay tuned for those in the future. However, I do want to mention one last property that we're tracking, which is a really fun one. The number of times that I bonked into the walls. And in this playthrough, I had 1,582 wall bonks. So hopefully in the second playthrough, I can play a little bit better and bonk into the walls less times. So now, let's talk about my second playthrough and the ways that I optimized Natu. To get things started, I just want to put things in context. Its current result would give it a placement at the end of the F tier after coughing. So I really am hoping that I'm going to shave a lot of time off this second playthrough. Unfortunately for me, there aren't a lot of places to save time in the early game. After all, I have fairly easy wins against both Faulkner and Bugsy, but I don't want to cut training because after them is Whitney, and her battle needs a lot of optimization. By the way, right now I'm going to show you footage from my rival fight in Azalea Town. And yeah, I forgot a Paralyzed Cure Berry here, so the rival actually ended up putting up a bit of a fight, but I managed to squeeze out a victory without any resets. So now let's talk about Whitney. The thing is, I tested my prior strategy and it only works if the mill tank does what it did in the last playthrough, which is use stomp on the first turn. However, it is much more likely to use rollout on the first turn, and when it does this, even with the gold berry, Natu is going to faint. So I can't use that strategy again, instead I need a new option, and I cannot believe that I'm going to say this, but the answer is train to level 30 and learn future sight. The reason is, is that the first turn in battle against Whitney, I can set up Future Sight against the Clefairy. Now, I want to mention something very specific about this move. When you use Future Sight, it calculates the damage based on the opponent's Pokemon that is currently in play. So my Future Sight is calculating damage based on Clefairy's lower special defense stat. After that, I can use exactly two returns to knock the Clefairy out, which means as soon as Miltank enters the field, it gets hit by Future Sight for more than half. Alright, I have to say, it is so satisfying seeing this work. I love when moves that I think are useless end up filling some niche. After that, I can just use two more returns, and I finish the mill tank off with no chance for it to knock me out. I absolutely love this strategy. It made the experience of playing this tiny little move-starved bird worth it. Okay, so let's jump ahead past Ecritique City, because I'm sure you're all curious which kind of hidden power I'm going to be using for Natu. And in this case, it just makes the most sense to go with Hidden Power Ice. This obviously solves Lance, which was a bit of a problem in the previous fight, and it also makes a lot of random NPC Pokémon easier to defeat. 
Plus, it gives Natu access to a special move earlier on. And it is here that some of you will probably be thinking that I need to take a hidden power that is going to make Karen easier, because dark types are a threat for Natu. So why not hidden power fighting, bug, maybe ground for the Houndoom, or fire for Jasmine's team? And the answer is, is that in Generation 2, the game calculates your hidden power's type and power based on your attack and defense DV exclusively. However, the game is also calculating your HP DV based on your other four DVs. If your attack DV is an even value, then your HP DV gets minus 8. And if your defense value is an even value, then your HP DV gets minus 4. So potentially, if I had like 12-12 in my attack and defense, then my HP DV would be 3. Which is quite far from perfect, and really is going to make my Pokémon have a lot less health in the late game. So, that example that I gave previously with 12 and 12 is Hidden Power Fighting. It is by far the worst Hidden Power type of any. Now, Hidden Power Bug is a little bit better, but not much. Ground has 12 in attack and 15 in defense, so it does only give you 7 in HP, and I just don't think that it solves enough problems throughout the rest of the playthrough to be warranted. Plus, ground moves, fighting moves, and bug moves are all physical, and Natu doesn't have great physical attack. Fire is special, but it only solves Jasmine, and it doesn't really help anywhere else that Ice wouldn't. So that's why I chose Hidden Power Ice for this playthrough. By the way, the DVs with Hidden Power Ice are 15 attack and 13 defense. In the case of all hidden powers, your speed and special can both be perfect values, so they always are for me. Okay, after that long hidden power rant, let's talk about Morty. I have a guaranteed one hit on his first Ghastly, and a 50% chance to knock out his Haunter with one hit. That also means that when he uses Curse, it is just going to knock itself out. After that on Gengar, I have a 97% chance to two hit. Because I have a Mint Berry, and because Hypnosis is bad, this battle is going to be completely trivial. So now, let's move on to Chuck. This time, I did all of my training before this fight, which gives me a boost of 6 levels when compared to my previous playthrough. This guarantees my 1 hit against the Primeape, and it gives me a guaranteed 2 hit on the Polyrath. Obviously, I picked up another Mint Berry before this fight, so just like Morty, there is no way for Chuck to mess me up either. I'm going to continue front-loading the training to save time in the late game, so I fight all of the extra rockets in the hideout, like all the ones that catch you from the security cameras. That gives me level 50 for price, and here, Psychic is a game changer. I can one-hit the Seal, I have a 50% chance to one-hit the Dugong, and a guaranteed one-hit on the Piloswine. As I demonstrated in my first playthrough at level 50, Jasmine is trivial, one-hit the Magnemites, and two-hit the Steelix. After that, I defeat the rival in the Rocket Plotline. Here, I want you to note the level. And then when I jump to the Claire footage, note that I am a significantly higher level. This is not specifically for her. After all, I have three one hits and a two hit on the Kingdra. What I want these levels for is because I want to go into the League at level 66. Because I have Hidden Power Ice, this isn't actually required for Lance. It is specifically required for Karen for damage ranges. So let's talk about that fight. At level 66, I have guaranteed the two hit against the Umbreon, and I have an 81% chance to one hit the Houndoom. Now you might think, why not just level up to like 67 or 68 to guarantee the one hit on the Houndoom? But I don't actually need to be much higher to face red. So I actually ended up using one rare candy to take me up from 65 to level 66, just so so that I could get a better range on the Houndoom and have a good chance of making it through this fight. Plus, these ranges really help to stabilize the battle, and it allows me to get to Lance without any resets. Okay, so I'm hardly going to talk about this fight. Hidden Power completely trivializes it. So, let's move on to Blue at the end of Kanto. Here I want you to note my level, because I'm almost 75 by the end of this fight. My goal for Red was somewhere between 83 and 85, so I end up training on a couple wild Pokemon just to take me up to level 76, and then I can use 9 rare candies to get to level 84. By the way, 85 doesn't really materially impact the Red fight, it only changes Psychic's damage range on the Venusaur, and I'm going to have full curse boosts by that time, and just one hit it with return anyway. So let's talk about ways that I can lose during this fight. I've identified three or four possibilities. First, Blastoise crits with Blizzard. Second, Blastoise freezes with Blizzard. Third, Snorlax gets a crit, which happens in my first fight, forcing an extremely painful first reset. However, in the next fight, it doesn't get a critical hit, I set up with Curse and knock it out. And that leads me to the fourth way that I could possibly lose, which is slightly skill-based. If I move on to the Charizard with less than ideal health, then if it gets a critical hit with Flamethrower, it is possible for it to knock Natu out. However, after that, if I have at least decent health, 
the Venusaur is going to try Solar Beam, and I'm going to be able to knock it out. So, Natu clocks in with a time of 2 hours, 4 minutes, and 8 seconds. Unfortunately, not under the two hour mark. But it did only have one reset. It finished the game at level 84, and this was a game time of eight hours and three minutes. Okay, so I've got a few things to say about this playthrough. For a Pokemon with sort of mid-range first stage stats and an awful move pool, Natu did all right. I think it honestly outperformed my expectations. When I initially looked at its move pool, I was just like, this thing is going to be absolutely terrible. Still, it does get placed near the very end of the tier list, just behind Gligar, and just ahead of Smeargle. By the way, all three of these Pokemon have very similar results. Gligar had a 2 hour and 3 minute result, Natu had a 2 hour and 4 minute result, and Smeargle had a 2 hour and 5 minute result. By the way, of all of these Pokemon, Smeargle definitely has the worst stats, and Gligar definitely got the worst move pool, which is saying a lot when I'm comparing it with a Pokemon like Natu. I think that the highlight of this run for me is the fact that Future Sight made an appearance. I am so glad that there was a legit way for me to include that in one of my playthroughs. Anyways, I'm still feeling that this tier list is a little bit top heavy, so I'm going to continue with some bad Pokemon in the coming months. Stay tuned for Wooper as well as Slugma. Now I'm sure all of you are very curious about one thing, which is, what are my bonk statistics for my second playthrough? And uh, unfortunately for me, I bonked into the walls 1700 times in the second playthrough, so that is an unfortunate increase of 118 bonks from the first playthrough. So obviously the second playthrough is just not nearly as optimized as it should be. I should do it again, get my bonks under 1500. Now I want to say a huge thanks to anyone who supports me on Patreon or through YouTube memberships. It really means the world to me. You allow me to get so much cool art drawn for this channel, as well as to hire people like Sean to do video editing for me so that I can focus on things like scripting and playthroughs. Also, it gives me a lot of time to think about programming challenges to solve, like which stats to track with our new ROM patch. And in this case, I just want to mention some of the things we're working towards. So we're working on tracking things like status conditions in battle. We would track three statistics specifically, the number of times my Pokemon had a status condition inflicted on it, the number of turns it spent in battle with that status condition, and the number of turns, for example, that it didn't attack because it was paralyzed. If, for example, my Pokemon was paralyzed for a total of 10 turns in battle during the playthrough, and it didn't move a total of 8 times, then of course I got some really bad luck, and I should be able to consider that when breaking ties between Pokemon in the tier list. My goal with developing all of these things is just to be as rigorous and fair for all Pokemon as is possible. So I hope that really comes across. Anyways, thanks so much for watching. This is the end of the video, so like, subscribe, ring the chime echo so you're notified when I post new content. If you've made it this far, thank you so much. You're incredible. I'll see you in my next video.